I asked the chair just before this began whether I had her permission to take off my jacket. She said, yes, but not your tie. <laughs> so, so this is the first time, the first time for a long time that I've used a tie. And it's a great privilege to be back in Edinburgh. One of the delights of coming here is it, it renews your faith in history. And I think it's a very important aspect that's being lost these days, that sense of culture and history in our education and all the values that go with it. And I'll come back to that later if I have time. I wrote a book in 2011 which has had a life of its own it's called The Precariat, The New Dangerous Class. For some reason, something's in the water. It's resulted in me being invited to speak in hundreds of places in 36 countries. It's been translated into 16 languages. This sort of thing doesn't happen once in a lifetime, and it's like being on a, on a, a ride. If you feel as if it could end tomorrow morning, and yet every morning I get new emails from hundreds of people, and I mean it. Over the last five years, I've received thousands and thousands of emails from people who just want to tell me that they feel they belong to the precariat, and the book is about them. That's very humbling. Sometimes it makes you cry, sometimes it makes you angry to read their stories. But it relates very much to the major subject of this evening. I want, first of all, to say a word about a particular sentiment. It's the sentiment of empathy. It's a bit unfair, but I think you can say the difference, or a major difference, between a conservative mind, a small c conservative, and a progressive mind is the role given to empathy. The former tends to rely mainly on morality. There are things you must do, there are things you should not do, and the way to behave is this way, and that leads to a social policy orientation of wanting to reform people wanting to punish those who deviate from some societal or class-based norm of behavior, and if not showing pity, then the next sentiment that David Hume so memorably put, contempt, stemming from pity. A person who is moved by empathy is someone who can always imagine themselves being in the shoes of the other. I have no right to reform you, or to make you better, or to integrate you into society. All of these pompous moralistic claims lead in very ugly directions. It leads, first and foremost, to a utilitarianism in politics, very much of a Jeremy Bentham type of morality, where in the interests of the greatest happiness, of the greatest number, one can justify punishing and making the minority miserable. And in recent decades, there has been a tendency in mainstream politics everywhere, not only to divide people into the deserving and the undeserving, but to identify minorities who are particularly targetable. I think that's a very unhealthy development and is very much to do with the narrative I want to debate this evening. The second difference between the conservative and the progressive is a profoundly different sense of freedom. The first tends to think in terms of Isaiah Berlin with negative liberty, 
freedom from constraints, and positive liberty, freedom of opportunity. The progressive says that's, that's not good enough. The progressive goes back to Aristotle and a line that goes through to Hannah Arendt and says, Republican freedom is about creating situations of non-domination. That's different from not being dominated. It means being in circumstances where you cannot be dominated, whether it be a figures of authority, a father, a husband, or whatever. That sense of republican freedom goes with the ability to act in concert, associational freedom, as Hannah Arendt called it. Now, I want to put those things aside for the moment and dwell on the main narrative that has guided the books that I've been writing and presenting in various places. But I'm going to do it very briefly. Those who've heard, it, heard me before will be pleased about that. We are undergoing a global transformation, the painful construction of a global market system. And in the process, the 20th century income distribution system as such has broken down. The idea that sort of dominated in the middle decades of the last century when the share of national income going to capital and the share going to labor was roughly stable, it was an implicit social compact, so that workers shared in productivity growth, etc. Let's go. And what we've seen in the last 30 years is a globalized labor market. The world's labor supply has quadrupled in the last 30 years. An extra two billion souls have come onto the open labor market, all habituated to expect a living standard of 1 50th of what a Scot or a German would have accepted as the norm. Now, of course, this has put huge downward pressure on our wages. And the wages of the group I'm about to talk about have gone down even further. And the first reality is that because we're in the middle of this global transformation, we would be deluding ourselves if we thought that our real wages are going to suddenly start rising. They may blip, but they're not going up. That's the first point. The second is a technological revolution is not resulting in mass automation. There's a lot of scare about this at the moment. But it is affecting the income distribution in profoundly regressive ways. And it's permitting and facilitating the transfer of jobs, production, and everything that goes with it, at the drop of a hat, instantaneously at the margins. And in the underbellies of globalization, what we've had is the development of what I call the most unfree market system ever created. Strong statement. But what it means is that Contrary to Thomas Piketty's story, which, with which I'm sure you're familiar, the tendency has been increasingly income in forms of rent have gone to the rentiers, the plutocrats, the elite, the people who have access to patents and copyright and brands and natural resources. The rental income has shot up incredibly and really dominates what's been happening to global capitals. And to facilitate that process and making it much worse, governments, especially the British government, but they're certainly not alone, have been generating far more subsidies. Subsidies that flow in one form or another to rich corporations, rich individuals, rich interests. 
All governments of industrialized countries spend at least 6% of their GDP on subsidies, mostly going to those interests. They are highly regressive. It's a reality. And when certain politicians talk about how bad it is to give something for nothing, they should think hard about those subsidies. But in the process as well, another part of the story which is really important is that the whole neoliberal project from the 1980s, derived from the Mont Pelerin Society and Milton Friedman, Friedrich Hayek and his friends, essentially has wanted not just the commodification of everything that can be commodified, but the systematic dismantling of all institutions and mechanisms of social solidarity. Mechanisms and institutions that had inbuilt in them a sense of empathy. Most fundamentally, the occupational guilds that had ruled working life everywhere for hundreds and hundreds of years. If you entered a guild as a young man or woman, you learned the ethics and codes of behavior and standards of conduct as you went through and you realized the value of reciprocity. It taught you those values. It may have been imperfect, I don't want to romanticize it altogether, but it was an institution for reproduction of empathy. The same with the firm. The old corporation, you entered it and you stayed in it, whatever your, if you did. Today, the firm is a primarily a commodity, subject to mergers and acquisitions, fracturing and, and outsourcing and all of these things. Even worse, the education system used to be fundamentally outside the market system as a system for embodying the values of empathy and solidarity and history. We learned our ethics alongside being an engineer or an economist or whatever it might be. Today, we have an education industry that processes people for the labor market. Profound change. But underneath all that, there has been this class fragmentation that has taken place. Today, we have a globalized class structure which is superimposed on old class structures. My Marxist friends, if I have any left, have been accusing me, I, I don't know how I do it, it's quite a strong claim, of betraying the working class because I think the concept is no longer good enough for purpose. I believe that we have a plutocracy and elite. I'm not going to define these. You know them, but you can read about them in the books. You have a salariat who have employment security and the trappings that go with it. You have the old proletariat who were habituated to a life of stable labor or being married to someone who had stable labor. All our labor laws, collective bargaining, unions, for, for the proletariat. The precariat underneath is not an underclass. There is an underclass. It's out in the streets in every city and town. It's a shame on every one of us in this room that it's growing. But the precariat, very briefly, can be defined in three dimensions. It has distinctive relations of production. It's being habituated to, to accept and internalize a life of unstable labor, an unstable living. That's the most obvious characteristic, but it is not the most important. More important is that people in the precariat don't have an occupational narrative to give to their lives. And they have to do a lot of work for labor, work that doesn't get counted in our statistics or in our social policy or in our textbooks. It suffers, those people in the precariat, from what I call the precariatized mind. You don't know what is the optimum use of your time. Do I do a bit more networking, retraining, applying for more jobs, applying for this? Da, 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 da. You're constantly under stress. 
The second dimension is that this is the first emerging mass class in history that has to rely almost entirely on money wages. Money wages without access to these wonderful benefits at the enterprise level or even rights-based benefits from the state. And these wages are lower and lower and becoming more and more volatile. It's volatility month on month or year on year, year is extraordinary. And so everybody in the precariat is living on the edge of unsustainable debt. Debt has become a mechanism. It's not an incidental aspect of society. The third dimension, which I believe is actually the most important of all, is that the precariat has distinctive relations to the state. I've used an old English word. I don't know if it was from Scotland as well, but I've always thought of it as an English town word from the Middle, Middle Ages, denizens. A denizen was somebody who went into a town and was given a more limited range of rights than the citizens of the town. But this is the first time in history where millions of people all over the world are in the process of losing the rights of citizenship, even in their own country. I'm not talking about refugees, which is a separate issue, or even migrants. But you can document how people in the precariat are losing cultural rights, losing civil rights, losing social rights, losing economic rights. They can't practice what they're qualified to practice. And losing political rights because out there they don't see a political agenda that relates to their needs and insecurities. Now, the precariat is, today is a dangerous class for various reasons. <coughs> Mentally stressed, the incidence of self-harm, precariatized mind problems. But it also has a distinctive consciousness. Wherever I go and talk to precariat groups, they're not just victims. They do suffer from anomie, alienation, anxiety, and anger, but they're not looking to go back in a majority of cases. But they're internally divided between atavists, those people falling out of old working class communities, perhaps with not a lot of education. They're looking backwards because their parents or grandparents had working class occupations of pride. Today they can't get that. It's this group that listens to the sirens of neo-fascist populism. Their current hero is a certain Mr. Donald Trump, a jackass of jackasses. Next year, the heroine will be Marine Le Pen, I'm going from here to Hungary, where the current hero of this ilk is an odious character called Viktor Orban. They're all over the place, and they're making hay. The second group are nostalgics. They don't have a sense of home. More and more people have some minority difficulty and are cut out, and they keep their head down. And the third part of the precariat is the one that offers us the future. Call it the progressives, the people who go to university or college and they come out into adulthood and they join others who are being denied a future. There is no future. They bought a lottery ticket at university and the lottery ticket costs more and more and it's worth less and less. They're getting angry. But they're not going for the Trumps. They're looking for a progressive politics. And that, I think, is one of the reasons why so many people have suddenly become interested in a basic income. The final point I want to make about the precariat is that this progressive part is looking for a revival of the Enlightenment. Liberté 
solidarity rather than fraternity, and egalité. But egalité of what? It's not a redistribution of the means of production. If I talk like that in a precariat meeting, everybody will rush for the bar. <laughs> this jackass is talking 19th century stuff. But what are the things they want redistributed? Well, first and foremost, security. The maldistribution of security, social and economic security most fundamentally, is far more unequal than the maldistribution of income. If you're up here in the stratum, you can buy or have total security. You may make it, must make it up, but you can get it. If you're down in the precariat, you have no security at all. None. And no way of acquiring it at the moment. The second key asset, which is fundamentally maldistributed, is quality time. The idea of being able to be in control of your time is fundamental to a good society. We need a politics of time. We don't have it. We need a slow time movement. We don't have it. The third key asset is quality space. The commons. We need a politics of the commons. Because everywhere, privatization and commodification of the commons is eating away at our essential freedoms. And that affects the precariat more than any other group. And the final things are education. Education for the elite is still there. You can still go to your top universities and get your history and your philosophy and your culture and all of those things. But more and more people are put into a commodifying education industry where they come out not knowing their civics, their history, their culture. We need to decommodify education. And the final thing, of course, is that rental capital. And that leads me to the final subject of the talk, where I'm probably most boring because I've been working on it for 30 years plus, plus. And that is the basic income must be a part of this new income distribution that has to be constructed. We've been working on it for 30 years, I'm going to come to a few facts, but I wanted to begin by acknowledging my old friend, not old in every sense, my old friend Annie Miller here, who was with me a founding member of Bien back in 86. And she's stayed the course, and I really salute you. And I think she will agree with me that we have been through a phase of being ridiculed, being marginalized, being regarded as mad, bad, and dangerous to know, to another phase where we had intellectuals joining and blah, 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 where we're interesting, interesting, but you know, a bit off the wall, to suddenly, in the last two, three years, we've become respectable. Now, I don't get too respectable, Annie, but we've become respectable because, as Keynes was meant to have said, I don't think he did say, it was apocryphal, he was accused of changing his mind on something. And the man was being very vehement. And Keynes turned around and he's supposed to have said, when the facts change, I change my mind. Pray, sir, what do you do? And I think a lot of people are seeing basic income in that regard. But I want to begin why I think a basic income has to be part of this new system by emphasizing what I think is the most important aspect of all. A basic income and moving in that direction is fundamentally about social justice. 
the ethical justification of moving in that way is the most important thing. I like to cite Thomas Paine and G.D.H. Cole, who both understood this. The wealth and income of every single one of us in this room is far more to do with the efforts and achievements of our ancestors, generations of them, than anything you or I could do ourselves. But we don't know whose ancestors made a bigger contribution, whose didn't, da 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 We don't know that. All we know is we are confronted with the collective wealth. And if you believe that inheritance of any sort should be allowed, then there should be a public inheritance of public wealth. So you could see that a basic income could be regarded as a social dividend on the returns of the collective wealth. I'm sure our benefactor, Angus Miller, being a financier, would have understood that argument. I hope he would. Because I think more and more of people who are making their money from finance and high tech are coming around to that understanding. Now, in addition, a basic income of all social policies available is the only one that could strengthen Republican freedom, give a sense of control of time, and move us towards a system of non-domination by others. It gives you security as a right. Very important issue. It also would reverse or help to reverse, it's not a panacea, help to reverse the inexorable trend to workfare in the state. Every government with a neoliberal orientation has been moving social policy more and more to workfare. In other words, you can only have benefits if you do X and Y that I decide for you, and you do it properly. If you don't, you're out. Clinton's welfare reform of 1996, new Labour's move in that direction, now that Ian Duncan Smith and his successor have all moved in that direction. What it means is you coerce the bottom, and never mind them. You sanction, you do this. Oh, it's arbitrary. It always must be arbitrary. So you have high type one and high type two errors. But something more subtle, it would also help reverse the slow or fast religification of social policy, the moralistic orientation that you're deserving or undeserving, and we must pity you unless you show no gratitude. <laughs> that tendency. We must also see it as helping to reverse a very ugly modern trend that when I was in my youth I thought was the past, which is the gradual trend to rely on private charity, philanthropy, arbitrary, discretionary. <laughs> that whole ethos opens up too many ugly things. But there's a new argument which is becoming more and more relevant and which might actually help us win the course. And that is because of that growth of the precariat and the growth of the first part, the atavists, and the growth of neo-fascist populism everywhere. Politicians and social scientists clergymen, different groups, are coming to realize that this is a very ugly, dark vista opening up. And that dark vista must be confronted very quickly or it will become a reality somewhere and then in many other places. Donald Trump is dangerously close 
I happened to be in Washington, D.C., speaking about the precariat the day he announced his candidacy. A whole lot of black women who, with whom I was having a discussion all jumped up and, hey! I said, what? No, they said, it must be funny now. It'll be a lot of fun. He's an idiot, but it'll, it'll create a bit of fun. Some fun. Okay? This new fascist populism is growing right across the spectrum. We see it in parties of the right being lured to the far right without saying so. Now, there are also instrumental economic reasons for moving towards a basic income. One is that currently we don't have any macroeconomic stabilizer built into our economic system. In the old days, when unemployment went up or a recession went up, the tendency of payments went up, so it acted as a counter-cyclical trend. Today, the opposite happens, and we need an automatic stabilizer, so a basic income could help in that regard. Second, and related to that, if people had a basic income, and what I'm advocating in the book is it should start at a small level and gradually build up, and that it should consist of three components. The first component, everybody has a base. The second component is that you have needs best supplements, if you're disabled or frail or elderly. And the third component would be the stabilization grant, that when the economy was in a recession, that amount would go up, which raised aggregate demand, and when you're in a boom, that part would be cut. Think for a second and then compare it with quantitative easing. Now, this is a polite audience, so I will not use any expletives. But as you all know, billions of pounds, billions of euros, billions of dollars, billions of yen have been handed out since 2008 to the bankers. Just think. That's the basic income for bankers. It's not so basic. They've been enabled to rebuild their fortunes. Even the BIS, the Bank of International Settlements, I was reading an article yesterday, have come out and confessed that that policy must and does create more inequality. And the evidence is overwhelming that it does very little for growth and doesn't work. And yet, they crowd on giving those Mario Draghi. Now think, if they can afford to do that, surely we can afford a basic income. Now, I think that another argument, which is more prosaic, is that a basic income, at whatever level you put it, would help to overcome the famous or infamous poverty trap. You all know the poverty trap. In Britain, even the Department of Work and Pensions has admitted that it's 80%. In other words, if you're on low benefits and you go into the sort of low-wage job that's available for the precarian, you are effectively facing a marginal tax rate of 80%. That's the official level. Not any wild lefty claiming, right? That means it's hardly any incentive to take those low-wage jobs. Can you imagine if the salariat or the elite of friends of George, George, George Osborne had a marginal tax rate of 80%? You think they would be quietly sitting by? I doubt it. I've just been in Denmark. The poverty rate, marginal tax rate there, is 86%. In Germany, it's 86 as well. In Finland, where we're going to come in my last few remarks, the head of the social insurance agency said, Guy, actually, there are quite a lot of people in Finland where it's over 100%. So you having a basic income would overcome that. And that leads to my final few remarks, because I would like to show, in a way, that there's something in the water. 
We're about to have our 15th Congress in Seoul, South Korea, and I was just making a list of all the famous people who've come out in favor of a basic income in the last 12 months. It's a long list, and I'm not going to go through it. But some very mainstream characters. And as you probably all know, on June the 5th, there will be a Swiss national referendum on whether a constitutional amendment should be introduced, saying that the country must be moving towards a basic income. It will not win because some of the leaders, against my advice, I can claim, have put an actual figure out. That figure is too high, 2,500 Swiss francs. It's not going to win. But what has been fantastic is the mobilizing of a public debate to the point now where the city of Lausanne has announced it will introduce a pilot, whatever the outcome. And people in Switzerland, I can go to an auberge, I can go to a talk, they know what it means, they know what it's about. That's a great advance. But it's the year of the pilots. And that is why I would appeal to all of us in this room and many others in Scotland to take the lead. I've been involved in piloting basic income in various countries since the beginning of this century. I think I can claim that as a unique aspect. If I look old and haggard, it's partly because of that. But there have been interesting pilots a long time ago in Dauphin, Manitoba, an incomplete one. There's one that happened by accident in North Carolina with Cherokee spending of the casino profits. We had a big pilot in Namibia where we provided a basic income for several years and monitored the effects. Then we did one in West Delhi where we gave everybody a choice. You either stayed with your government subsidized food and stuff, or you took a basic income of an equivalent value. About half and half went for the options, but after three or four months, a lot of people were coming to our field workers and saying, please, can we change to the basic income? And then we did a bigger pilot in Madhya Pradesh, where we provided 6,000 men, women, and children with a basic income, and over two years compared what happened to them with an equivalent number living in other villages. Very important that we did it on a community basis. Everybody in one community received it, everybody in another didn't. Very important. And what we found, briefly, is there were huge welfare effects. Nutrition improved, health improved, sanitation improved, school attendance improved, school performance improved. It also had economic effects. The economic activity in those villages increased. People did more work, more labor. The only group that did less, very sadly to report, were the children. They were going to school. We can't have everything. In addition, we found there were equity effects. Because the people who benefited disproportionately were the disabled, the women compared with the men, the frail compared with others, the scheduled castes compared with the upper castes. But the most exciting thing, which I've written up in the other book that's available if you're interested, is that the emancipatory value of the basic income is much greater the money than the money value. People who had the basic income were enabled to make decisions for themselves. They pooled money in some respects. They dealt with their particular constraint. They bought their freedom from a debt money lender. They did whatever was necessary to gain a little freedom. And I'll end that bit by saying a little story. I went to one of the villages 
at the beginning when we were launching it. And all the young women had veils. And we couldn't get them to take their veil off to have their photo taken to get their cards to receive the basic income. So they had to go in a hut, and they were all private. And six or seven months later, I went back to that village, and I said to one of my Indian colleagues, I said, have you noticed a change in this village? And he said, no, no. I said, well, none of the women are wearing veils. He said, yeah, that's true, yes. So we eventually persuaded some of the women to come across and talk to us, and we asked. And they wouldn't give an answer straight away. But then one of them said, before, when the elders told us we had to do things like that, we had to do it. Now we have some money, we can do what we wish. It's an important bit of freedom. Today, there are 19 Dutch cities planning basic incomes. I was on a long panorama type program on it. They're very exciting. In Finland, the prime minister has come out in favor of a basic income and has put aside 20 million euros, the equivalent, to do a basic income starting later this year. I'm very privileged to be involved in that in various ways. In Ontario, huge group of doctors from all the major hospitals, very appropriate here, have formed a group to demand that the Ontario authorities do a pilot. Lausanne is going to. The UK, a few weeks ago, they did a program in which I was involved, a series, where they gave a few people what amounted to a basic income. I said to them at the beginning, this is not what I regard as a basic income because a community is what should be involved. And I said there's a weakness of will problem. If you give a lump sum, people tend to make bad decisions. But I was rather relieved to find that the families that received their basic income took advantage and they all managed to improve their lives. <laughs> Last two weeks ago, Anthony and myself were at a conference in Zurich for the Swiss referendum. And I shared the platform with a man who has got more money than all of us in this room put together, multiplied by something else. And he is devoting $20 million to pilots in Africa. On Sunday, I received a Skype call from Silicon Valley and a man, I'm not meant to say his name, a man has just put $20 million into doing a pilot somewhere in the United States. When I said, in the course of this discussion on Skype, I said, this is serious money, so it requires serious planning, serious research, a good team, etc." I said, 20 million is a lot. I was interrupted and told that there are three other people all planning to give in 10 million more. Add it up and that comes to 50 million. That's something that is happening from the high-tech plutocrats who are worried about the pitchforks coming. They're worried about the pitchforks and they're having nightmares, as several said when I went to Silicon Valley. I don't mind the motive, but we need pilots. And Scotland, with the SNP's new commitment to move in this direction, has a fantastic opportunity to do something like this. It's desperately needed, and Scotland could set an example, because if it does, then I think you'll see a fire of copycats. It is something we all must encourage. And on that note, I thank you very much for listening, and I hope the basic income is something whose time has come. Thank you very much.
Thank you, um, Guy. Um, Guy speaks with incredible authority because, as you heard from his talk, he's not simply a philosopher, although he is that. He's someone that's done this and has got the credibility from having done it, um, it using the most up-to-date research methods you can imagine. So he speaks with real authority on basic income. The RSA um, has come to this um, as well. We're one of the people on the list in the last year or so um, who have put our head above the parapet and advocated a basic um, income for the UK, but the arguments apply um, beyond the UK as well. And I think there is something different that is going on currently. Um, it was interesting on Twitter, and there was a journalist who sort of sprang a tweet at me and said, where's all this coming from, this basic income stuff? This always comes around and it goes again, and it's, it's, it's all a bit, you know, it doesn't really work, and politically it's a disaster. Um, but this time it does feel like there is something different. And I sense that there is an understanding that goes from Silicon Valley to policy elites, to academic observers, to people who are suffering in being in the state of, a, of precariat themselves, um, who realize that something is going fundamentally wrong with the way our economy and society supports people's ability to build their own lives. And that is why ultimately the RSA has supported a basic income it is because it is a platform, a foundation of security, on, of, uh, of freedom on which people can build their lives. And that, for us, is the essence of freedom. If you can build a good life, you're in a state of being free. You are free from a state of having the potential to be dominated. And I think underpinning our thinking as well as this Republican notion of freedom um, that Guy um, talks about. We give people a fighting chance. Now, I want to go back to something that Guy said right at the beginning about where this sort of moralistic brand of politics um, has got us. And what's really interesting about basic income, incidentally, is the sort of universality of its appeal across the philosophical spectrum. You know, I've heard Greens, I've heard Libertarians, I've heard Socialists, I've heard Communists, I've heard Liberals, I've heard some Conservatives. Um, advocate um, for a basic income. But this moralistic impulse that has started to um, bore its way into our politics and public life, where we are ignoring the impacts of a lot of things that we have been doing um, as a political society and how that is making people's lives incredibly difficult. Um, Guy described it as um, a, um, a state of workfare, and I think that's essentially what we have been doing. We have been putting people in a position where the state, at our behest, is master over their lives. And the way that this is justified is it might get them into some short-term wage work, but the medium and long-term consequences of this will be enormous. And if you want one symbol of that, it's the hundreds of thousands of people that are turning up at food banks in any given year in a society such as modern Britain. So clearly something is going wrong. And I think the debate which has captured the imagination of campaigners in Finland and Netherlands, Switzerland, Germany, France, US, Canada, the list goes on, is part of the realization that um, that this is a policy that starts, well, actually, it's beyond the policy. It's a, it's a very different way of thinking about our relationship to one another and our relationship to the state and our relationship to the economy. So that's far beyond the policy, but it's something that offers us something to cling on to in what has become a very insecure environment. Now, there's been lots of conversation about the robots and automation and artificial intelligence and all those things, uh, and they will impact um, our economy, they will impact the job mar market. Um, they will impact people's ability um, to transition through changes. We don't know how quickly, we don't know um, to what quantum. But the point is even before that stuff really gathers pace, if it ga gathers pace, there is a great deep well of insecurity to begin with. And it's one that we have been adding to. And it's no point saying that they, the government has done it to it. We've allowed, as a political society as a whole, to discuss 
people's lives in a way that is far removed from the reality of their motivations, their capability, um, their, 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 their um, family lives, the decisions they're making. We have objectified people in a way that I think we should be ashamed of. Um, and there is time as a political society to stand back and reflect on the consequences of many of the things that, that we have been doing. How can we change? There has to be conversation about the situation. There has to be conversation about the real alternatives. When you first mention basic income to people, and I'm sure Guy's done this probably about 500,000 times, that you get a recoiling action. Like, this is, this is crazy stuff. You're just going to give people money, and we're not going to ask for anything in return. What on earth is wrong with you? We've got to get over that impulsive reaction. Um, because I think it's a factor of the way that we've talked about politics and society. Um, and I think the only way to overcome that is start to open out the discussion more and start to challenge that impulsive reaction. Because that ultimately has consequences. And the consequences are the 80-odd percent tax withdrawal rates, the people at the food bank, the people being sanctioned, people not being able to make decisions about their lives, the people not being respected and held in esteem for the caring responsibility that they, they are pursuing, or going back to re-educate themselves, or setting up a business. That's a consequence. So we've got to start to push back. We can't allow the, the simple narrative that has developed. So we've got to find a way of talking about these issues that is different to the current political discourse. Um, beyond that, I think we have got to start thinking about how we can get to a pilot. Unfortunately, I think you do have to prove your case. Um, it's not enough. I mean, the amazing pilots that have been done in India and Namibia and elsewhere, I think, provide some very interesting data, enough to form a decent hypothesis about what the impacts might be for a basic income. But they're not going to win a political debate. And I think even if we have the pilots in Finland and Netherlands and Canada that are planned, I think we still need a UK-based pilot, so it's part of our own political conversation about the future of our society. Actually, let's do even better than that. Let's have it in Scotland. Scotland seems to me, and we've had an enormous amount of interest, you know, um, since our report came out, but there was already a movement here that was producing ideas and arguments around basic income. Reform Scotland, Carnegie Trust, um, Citizens Basic Income Network. There's a whole plethora of organisations, BN itself, um, for, for many decades. There's already a vibrant Scottish conversation around it, far more vibrant than the UK conversation is, is, is wide conversation is currently. So there's an opportunity here. We've been approached by some incredibly surprising people from Silicon Valley, the world of um, British political life. I can't out them yet but one day I hope to be able to out the conversations that we've been having. Um, local authorities across the country have been contacting us saying, we know that this is not working. We want to do something different. So I think together we may be able to have a think about how we can go about achieving that and achieve what is a policy that has idealism, um, but it also has practical possibility as well. And we've got to marry those two together. That's what the RSA ultimately is about. And if we can get there, it would be an expression, going back to the very beginning of Guy's talk, an expression of our empathy for one another. And not only an expression of our empathy for one another, um, an expression of our ability to build institutions that foster further empathy. So we realize that we are genuinely in this together. Um, that we're not alone, and actually we can continue to try to hide bad institutions, but inevitably the consequences will come back to bite us. Indeed, they are already. So hopefully we can have a conversation, both interrogating the idea and thinking about how we can spread the conversation further this evening. And I'd like to take some questions from the floor. Right at the back, we've got one. I'm now sort of switching hats. I'm going to be chair. Sorry. Yes. Can you, can you say who you are, please? I'm just about to. Robbie Mochrie from Heriot Watch University. Um, Professor Standing mentioned Annie Miller. Uh, Annie actually retired so that I could take up my lectureship. So uh, hopefully there is a degree of continuity in the work we do at Heriot Watt. Questions that I have for you, Professor Standing. Um, 
Can you speak? Can you speak? Can you shout to this one, please? Sorry. I can just about hear. Tis on. Right. The questions that I would like to ask you, Professor Standing, <laughs> <laughs> relate to um, some of the things which I think perhaps you missed out. Um, you, uh, the relation you, you mentioned, for example, rents. But you didn't think about the questions to do with the tax system, and particularly the taxation of earned income, the taxation of savings. I also would also be interested, if I might slip in a second question, because this is what I'm really interested in, how credit cooperatives might work with basic income. You talked about this to some extent, I think, when you were mentioning the Indian work, and of course development work in uh, uh, Indian programs very much emphasizes the role of access to credit in order to develop small-scale business. I'd be very interested in your comments on those. Interesting. And there was not another question. Um, thank you very much for that uh, talk. Um, Professor Standing, if you believe, like me, that the age of the hermetically sealed nation-state is coming to an end and we're entering an era of mass migration, I'd be interested in how basic income uh, might uh, thrive in that circumstance, okay. hypothetical circumstance. Great. Thank I'm going to give Guy an opportunity to respond to those, and if you can prepare your questions for the next round, we'll, we will be taking another round. You could, you could just take that. Uh, I'll stand here, and then people at the back can see. Uh, two good questions. Uh, in When you're giving a talk like that, well, I always have this sense when you sit down, you say to yourself, now, what was it that I've missed out? <laughs> and I've just been sort of ticking a few things. And, and I, all I can say is that the points I'm about to make are covered in more detail in the book that's downstairs. I don't think you need to be thinking of the back of the envelope uh, calculations, you know, pick up a number and you say, oh, they want to give so much per week, 65 million, and then what's the tax rate? And then they do back of envelope calculation. You don't want to think like that. You want to think of what are the options for, for actually building up a basic income as an anchor and where you would mobilize the funds. My own preference is actually to develop a sovereign wealth fund, a democratically governed sovereign wealth fund. Along the Alaska model, the Alaska Permanent Fund has been built up so to the point where every Alaska resident receives an annual basic income as a resident. When the fund was established, Alaska had the highest poverty rate of all US states and the biggest Gini coefficient of income inequality. Today, it has the lowest poverty rate and the lowest Gini coefficient. It's not just oil. You can have such a sovereign wealth fund from high tech, the rental profits. The Norwegians did a fantastic thing with their North Sea oil. Be careful here, Guy, what you call it. <laughs> Whereas in Britain, they privatized it, and so now today, some elite corporations are very wealthy. The Chinese state enterprises, Margaret Thatcher would love that, are running a lot of it. Whereas Norway, by building its sovereign wealth fund, today, today every Norwegian is a millionaire in practice. So you've got the ability to build up sovereign wealth funds. There are 60 countries or more now with sovereign wealth funds. The point is that they should be democratically controlled. And your second part of your question on credit cooperatives, it just reminded me that we did the pilot in Madhya Pradesh with SEWA, which is the Self-Employed Women's Association, and they run a lot of co-ops. And one of the things we noticed in some of the villages, which is documented in the book, is that spontaneously, without us being involved at all, some of the villages set up co-ops in order to channel the investment and all the needed administration, small-scale administration. And one in particular, they converted the, the local late into a fish cooperative so that the diet of the village was transformed. I think cooperatives are still relevant in the 21st century 
But I think that they must be local and self-sustaining and therefore not the solution up here, but something that takes place inside society. Um, the second question, or the third question as it was, I'm reluctant to say the nation state per se is coming to an end. Whether one has a Catalonia or a Scotland that is an independent state and other states that come into existence, we must think of the state as the institutions of society that comprise and shape society. And in that regard, I think that one of the complaints made about a basic income, that it would, you know, you encourage in migration, a flood of people wanting to get the basic income, is actually a very unfair criticism, okay? Because today's means-tested system, means-tested behavior testing, means in effect that you give to the most poor who get to the front of the queue. And there was a famous study done in East London which showed that the anti-foreign racist sentiments had been fermented by the means-tested system because the ordinary citizen felt that they weren't getting first in the queue. Because that's means-testing. You give it to the people who can be, prove they're poorest. Whereas with a basic income, you would do it as, say, everybody who is a Scot living in Scotland would have priority, and then legal migrants coming into Scotland would earn the right to receive a basic income. Treat the two issues of migration and refugees and citizens separately. Famous thing, don't try and play golf with one club. You know, a basic income would actually enable people to feel they have a right Whereas a means testing, you don't have any rights. So I think it's unfair criticism because you should be making that criticism of the, the existing schemes. And the existing schemes lead to David Cameron and all these characters wanting to be discriminatory and, and vicious towards anybody who calls themselves a migrant. Well, I'm a migrant. So I think that way is utilitarian and leads ugly directions. Whereas a basic income gives you a better basis for building. Yeah. I think there's all, all, always a question here about how you get into the system. And I think pragmatically what you have to do, I mean, in both questions, there, there is a pragmatic answer to it. I mean, you have to kind of get a basic system in place. You may then look for you know, sovereign wealth funds and like to build over time to support. Um, but alongside that, what you can't do is, is, is take on the debate around, around migration alongside the debate about basic income. The, these are different political conversations and they just need to understand how they relate, relate together. Okay, I'm gonna take this lady here. Gosh, suddenly a flurry. And then this lady here, and then the gentleman at the back there. So all in this, this first half. Could you give then I'll name? go to the back of the room. Could you, could you give your name, please? Um, I'm Sheila Young. Um, in my day job, I'm director of Homestar, which is a charity that supports families. Yes. Um, it's ridiculous that some of the work that we do is needed because we are propping up a system that makes those families disadvantaged. And most of our volunteers would recognise that a great deal of the parenting support that those families need is, is made more necessary because of things like in-work poverty, very low incomes, lack yes. of access to good quality food and all of those kind of issues. But even so, I suspect if I stood up in front of all of our volunteers and staff today and said, I advocate a basic income, we should be lobbying for this as an organisation because we could see some real impact on the families we support. I think what would come back to me is that um, anxious response, which I would characterise as the moral hazard response. Just like when I worked in an aid yeah. agency and we talked about debt relief. Yeah. Well, if we give people something, won't they all stop working? Yeah. And I think, for me, that argument. I, I tend to subscribe to the sort of Gramscian view of common sense. We have a common sense understanding that bears no relation to reality. Mm. There's a common sense that says people given a basic income will not work and yet we see people choose to work and to work very hard for a variety of reasons and causes even when they don't need to. We know that's true and yet that's the issue we have. So my question is what have we learned from pilots that helps refute the moral hazard argument? Great, thank you. And then this lady here. 
So I have two questions. Um, my first one... What was your name, sorry? Sorry, my name's Sarah. I'm a student of the University of Edinburgh. And um, I'm just wondering if, if you would apply this on a societal level, what are the potential inflationary effects of uh, basic income? I'm also wondering what you think about the idea of a negative tax rate and if that could yeah. work together with a basic income or what your thoughts are on that. Okay, thank you. Now, it's a gentleman at the back. Yeah. I'm going to go to the back of the room for the next round of questions. Uh, my name's Donald Scott. Um, some of us who are involved in uh, the Positive Money campaign to change the way in which money is created away from being created in the self-interest of the private banks to a state creation of money. We have thought that that agenda could work quite well alongside the basic income agenda. Yeah. And I'm just wondering if you might comment on that. Okay, thank you. Jim? Yeah. Thank you. Good, good questions. Um, the first one is basically the, the, the most common prejudice that ever comes up. I'm not saying you hold it, I'm just saying it's, it's out there. Okay, the idea that if you gave people a basic income, they would reduce labor, or become idle, go surfing, or whatever. The evidence and the psychological studies have refuted this hypothesis so often that it's become boring. The psychologists have shown that if people have basic security, we don't have basic security, they have more confidence, more entrepreneurial vigor, more intelligence in a short-term sense and are prepared to work harder and more productively. A lot of evidence out there. In the pilots we've done, overwhelmingly the evidence showed that people who received the basic income worked more, not less. And particularly women, but you have to measure it very carefully. And that leads to what I always regard as fundamental to this whole debate. We realize that every age has had its stupidity about what is work and what is not work, right? They have managed to convince us that the only work that deserves respect and remuneration yeah. is doing labor. Yes. So if you pour tea for a boss, you're a good citizen. If you pour tea for a frail relative, you're not working. Now, you can't get more stupid or sexist than that, but that's the reality we're facing today. And we really need to reconceptualize what it is we mean by work. And one of the great things, and that was one of the ticks I'd put down, why didn't you mention it, I'll ask myself afterwards, is that one of the advantages of moving towards a basic income is that it would tilt the incentives to do other forms of work that are not labor. And therefore, it is more ecological in that sense, because it would encourage us to do more work that is about reproducing ourselves, reproducing our families, reproducing our communities, doing our allotments, whatever it might be, being an artist, being creative. In a sensible way of looking at society, all of these things would be seen as work. So we've got to escape from that laborist approach of the 20th century. It's very, very important for creating sustainable growth, sustainable development, and the ecological crisis that's shouting at us. So for me, I think we've got to overcome that prejudice. The evidence is overwhelming that, that people don't stop. They've just done a survey in Switzerland. This is before the event, and they ask people, if the basic income is introduced, will you reduce your labor? 98% said, 
it would not reduce their labor. Okay? Now think of it in that way. We spend millions and millions of pounds chasing up a few people who might or might not be lazy. Our administrative structures, we spend vast amounts. Well, these people probably aren't very productive anyhow, and they would be much better to be encouraged to be active. But we waste an enormous amount of money. If 1% if of the Scottish population doesn't want to work, I'm not going to cry. Are you going to cry? <laughs> The fact is that we want to improve our lives. We're not going to sit on our backsides if we just have a basic income that can just pay for our food and rent yeah, perhaps. That's right, that's right. So to me, this is, this is a deliberately false prejudice. Not from you, I'm sure. <laughs> the last thing I want to say about to Sarah or, and Donald, but Sarah's point about inflation. Whenever I'm asked that question, I say this is one-handed economics, okay? Because you forget the supply side. If you put money into a community, you think that inflation is going to go up. But that forgets the elasticity of supply of basic goods and services. Because if more money is available in local communities, surprise, surprise, but people start producing more goods and more services because there's a return to doing that. Local goods and services, another ecological advantage. And what we found in our pilots is strangely that the unit prices of basic goods and services in those communities went down during the course of the pilot. They were making more money because they were selling more, but the unit prices were going down. So that, to me, is another prejudice, which we can answer, and the book does deal with that. As far as the positive money uh, concerned, I tend to be a bit cautious of that, because there are a lot of moral hazards, a lot of immoral hazards in creating new currencies alongside others, and all of this, all of this area is in a globalized system. Uh, would increase uncertainty and risks. I may be wrong, I don't have strong views on it, but I, I tended to be suspicious of it, and, and I think it's an interesting debate about Bitcoin and all of these things, but, but I prefer to keep that one separate just as I prefer yeah. to, to keep the refugee issue separate. Yeah, and on, on the negative income tax point, I mean, I think the difference between basic income and negative income tax is basic income is something you have that's yours. They, they essentially work in many of the same ways. But a negative, I mean, if you look at tax credits and how easy they've been to cut over the last few years, the reason is because people don't feel that they own them. It's not theirs. It's just a number on, on, on a payroll sheet. Um, and I've got to say, Homestar is an extraordinary charity. And I hope you all support it with, with donations. Um, but on to the point about moral hazard very, very briefly. The point is, yeah, just imagine that the parents weren't doing the right things, and we could identify that, and they were using public money to do nothing. And then we decided we were going to punish them for that. What about the kids? And we never talk about the impact of the kids. Every day, your volunteers see what the impact is on, on, on the kids. And maybe we should talk about them a bit more in this whole, whole discussion. Let's take another round. I'm going to go to the back of the room this time. Gosh, we might have to take four this time. But I'm going to try and, I'm going to take two from the back. I'm going to take two from the front. Who's going? For Let's that? take the gentleman with the, with the blue shirt right at the front there and um, the gentleman behind him. So the one right in the front row. Okay, thank you. Hey, my name's Raymond Taylor. I'm one of the people who've been chasing you up, guys, so I hope to speak to you at the end of the night. Uh, I'm a social worker and an associate at the University of Strathclyde, and I'm particularly interested in, from the research studies that you've carried out, what impact has the basic income had on the lives of children, and in particular, young people? Thank you. And the gentleman right behind you. Just so. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Professor Standing. Um, you described Araya the beautiful baby, the basic income. I admire it immensely, but it's not immediately available to, to me. So I want you to express an opinion on another baby which exists, and it satisfies your criteria of uh, utilizing empathy and autonomy. It's called time banking. 
advanced okay. systems. Okay, thank yeah. you. Thank you. This, this lady here. My name is Jenny Ingalls. Um, I would be interested to know what kind of indications there might be of the way it changes the nature of the sort of work that people do, maybe particularly in societies that might be similar to um, Scotland. Um, and, uh, you know, I think you hinted at the sort of ecological um, potential of it, but I wonder if it changes what people choose to do for work. Great, thank you. I know it was this lady here. My name is Maria Pakbahan. I'm a student at Edinburgh University. Um, my question about this universal social security through the basic income, how are you scaling up? Because you're talking about the pilot projects so far. And related to that with the, the decent work issue that the ILO actually promoted. OK, thank you. Uh, I've been told to keep it snappy. Uh, okay, I'll try to be. Um, on the first question, this is where I get rather emotional because uh, when we did our pilots, we weighed and measured the babies and the infants. And the WHO has a Z score index. Some of you may be familiar with it which is weight for age, right? And not surprisingly, and we've got this in the book, that you have a distribution of children, young children, this is from zero to five, age five, where the distribution is skewed to the left. In other words, the majority are malnourished, right? That's typical of in developing country, you get a long tail. And the girls are more skewed to the left than the boys. You know, they're over here. After about nine months of the pilot, we were measured the babies and young children, did a lot of regression analysis and so on. And we got this graph. And I said to my colleagues, I said, look, you're all Hindus, but I'm a European. But this is when I hear Mozart in my ears. Because the distribution of the Z scores had moved very close to being normal mm. for the world. Mm. But what was really causing the music was the fact that the girls' distribution had moved closer to the norm than the boys. I found this remarkable. So we did some extra surveying to think, why was this? And it was because of the individualization of the basic income and the fact that the girls and the families suddenly were treated as equals because they had their basic income through their mothers. And to see those two results has always brought tears to my eyes. The second thing is about time banks. You didn't quite get to the full of it, and I appreciate that. But a long time ago, I used to work with famous Swedish economist who should have received the Nobel Prize, in my view, Rudolf Meidner. And they had ideas in Sweden of a time bank. I like their concept. The trouble is it requires decent wages to build up your time bank credit. That's, that's one of the difficulties, the practical difficulties in a market society. And also, it doesn't allow for free choice, and often you have to do something. So that, there, are, there are certain things. The, as far as the change in type of work, I think one of the great things about a basic income, and we've seen it in Brazil, with the Bolsa Familia, we've seen it in our pilots as well, is you embolden and strengthen people's ability to say no. You would strengthen their ability if, you, if I think you're really exploiting me in a lousy bullshit job, I can say no. Yes. And that ability to say no strengthens your bargaining position. Either they will raise the wages in those, in that cir in those circumstances, or they will automate whatever it is, 
or it won't be done, right? But it would help the labor market actually drive improvements, and that's, I think, is important. As far as your comment on decent work, if you saw me twitching at that point, it's because that in 1999, I'd been thrown out of the ILO by the politics, the US and others, and the new director general came in and he said, I want you back, I want you uh, in my team for restructuring. And I said, well, only if we move to promoting work, not labor. So it took a long evening of heavy drinking with him and me <laughs> before he got it. And then I said, look, why don't we have a slogan to go forward into the 21st century? Dignified work. Dignified work. I then made the mistake of going away for the weekend. And when I came back on the Monday, the draft report which I had contributed had the title, Decent Work. And I went and I said, no, 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 no. He says, too late. They all wanted decent work. I said, decent is, is low barrier, low barrier. Dignity is what it should be about. And I still feel that way. Thank you. I'm going to have to leave the audience hungry, I think, at that stage. I'm really sorry. Um, and I think we could have carried on for quite some more time. Um, but let the debate continue. Um, I'm now going to ask um, Tanya to come to give a vote of fat thanks. But I should just say, if Guy hasn't tantalized you enough, I would have a look out for his book. It is available in the foyer if you want it. Um, but if not today, get it off Amazon, wherever. <laughs> Amazon is not popular. <laughs> Don't get it. Get it from. Uh, get it from Waterstones, <laughs> or your or your local your local independent bookseller. <laughs> right. Hello. Firstly, I would like to thank the Miller family because without them we would not be here. Professor Standing, it was an extremely interesting talk. Slightly terrifying in places when we think of the sort of world we really do live in. Um, I must, you agree with your cooperative, I'm involved with TIAW based in New York, the International Alliance of Women. And we give out microcredits to Africa and, and uh, India and various countries. But I have to tell you, this only, the cooperative only work with women. We have had yes. no success whatsoever with men. <laughs> I would like to thank Anthony Painter for joining us tonight and for chairing the meeting. Our RSA fellows uh, for their work here um, to uh, rushing around with the microphones and things. RAF staff, RSA staff under the guidance of Director of External Affairs Nina Bolognesi for her logistic support and Democracy TV for live streaming the event. And lastly, Surgeon Hall staff for the hospitality. Um, so thank you very much, all of you, for coming and making this such a lively debate. Thank you. Thank you.